the teaching of arrhythmia, particularly to medical students, etc., is very complicated. And this is how I simplify when I'm teaching to junior doctors and medical students. Basically, there are only two types of tachycardia. There's the ones that are regular, which are the tachycardias, and the irregular ones are the, are the fibrillations. And they can either be in the atria or the ventricle, and that just gives you four basic abnormal heart rhythms. Then I separate from that those that intimately involve the AV node. Sometimes they're classed as SVTs. We know that's wrong, but those two tachycardia, the AVNRT and AVRT. And I think you can very easily simplify arrhythmia teaching by using those terms. We're focusing then on arrhythmia that simply involve the atria only. And then I would further classify these into four different groups. Atrial fibrillation, which I'm not going to mention, and these two that have been very well discussed by Jesus in the last lecture. Those that are a macro reentrant tachycardia dependent on the right atrial isthmus. And I put this as a separate group because they're so common and that's the only time I allow the students to use the words atrial flutter when they're saying typical atrial flutter. And then we have all the other macro reentrant tachycardia that can occur in the right or left atrium. In other words, the non tricuspid valve IVC isthmus dependent tachycardia. My job is to talk about focal atrial tachycardia. And just because it's focal, it really means that the entire mechanism of the tachycardia is located in a very small area, perhaps less than two centimetres, I've read in some text, but that's really just an arbitrary cutoff. It doesn't mean that the mechanism is automaticity, because the mechanism could just as easily be uh, re-entry, just a very small re-entrant circuit or a micro re-entrant circuit. So we have then two mechanisms of focal atrial tachycardia, automaticity and re-entry, or a micro re-entrant circuit. And we know from the EP lab and from clinically that the, these behave in slightly different ways. Automaticity, they are uh, cells that are exhibiting pacemaker-like behavior, phase four depolarization. So they tend to be catecholamine driven. They tend to come on with exercise. In the EP lab, they exhibit a warm-up phenomena. So you can't get them going at first, but after you've done lots of pacing and burst pacing and, and, and got things warmed up, you can then often get the tachycardia going. They can be suppressed, therefore, by beta blockers, verapamil, which is a useful clinical treatment for them. And in the lab, we often have to use isoprenaline to get them going. Contrast that with micro reentrant tachycardias, which, because they're reentry, they're likely to be induced by program stimulation. And therefore, entrainment is possible. And as Richard mentioned a minute ago, entrainment mapping could be quite useful for tracking down the origin of these tachycardia. And further, because of the reentrant circuit, they can be terminated by adenosine. Um, now, ablation of the, the mechanism is exactly the same because you're ablating in a very small area. So whether it's focal or micro reentrant, you're still going to be ablating in the same general area. But it is quite useful to understand the mechanism in terms of when we map it. Now, what anatomical locations do we commonly find them? Well, the two commonest are probably the crystal terminalis in the right atrium and the pulmonary veins. But you, you can find focal atrial tachycardia emerging from pretty much anywhere else around the bundle of his, coronary sinus, uh, mitral valve annulus, etc., etc. And we'll cover some of those today. So um, when you look at ECG of somebody with a focal atrial tachycardia, it's obvious that it's an atrial tachycardia when you have more atria than ventricle, uh, than QR, uh, more P waves than QRS complexes. It's virtually impossible for this to be anything else other than atrial tachycardia. Now you might say, oh, this could be AVNRT with a, you know, a lower common pathway or something. But I mean, that's putting those extreme rarities aside. Um, this is an atrial tachycardia, and the fact that you have a very discrete P wave in the context of a normal heart probably means that it has a focal mechanism. But the ECG can be fooling, particularly when you have any sort of scarring or disease in the heart. You cannot necessarily rely on the ECG. But the morphology of the ECG can be helpful in telling you where the focus is. And there are several algorithms. I choose this one because I work with Peter in St. Bartholomew's. But there are several groups have brought algorithms together so that you can look at the ECG and make an assessment of where the focus of the atrial tachycardia 
is. But of course, to do that, you need a good look at the unencumbered P wave. It's no good if the QRS complex is on top of it or the T wave is on top of it. You need somehow to look at the P wave. And so you may need to use adenosine to show AV block or do some ventricular pacing so you get a good look at the P wave so you can work out its morphology. And also, this is only relevant in structurally normal hearts. Once you have any scar, any previous ablation, these algorithms become less and less accurate, as you will see with some examples. But generally, if you look at leads 1 and AVL, if, it, if the P waves are positive in 1 and AVL, it's likely to be coming from the right side of the heart. And if they're negative in 1 and AVL, it's likely to be coming from the left side of the heart, much when we look at other uh, arrhythmia as well. So you've got general rules. When it's positive in V1, it's usually coming from the back of the heart, very often coming from the uh, left atrium. But if you carefully follow these algorithms, you can sometimes work out, looking at the ECG, where you expect the focus to be. And that can be helpful when you're planning, mapping, and ablation strategy for these patients. So when you have a one-to-one -one, um, uh, P wave to QRS complex, you then can't be so sure that this is an atrial tachycardia. This is a form of long RP tachycardia, as we describe on the ECG. The timing from the QRS complex to the P wave, the RP interval is longer than to the following QRS complex. <coughs> and therefore, normally there are three mechanisms that can lead to this. Atrial tachycardia that we're talking about, atypical AVNRT, and orthodromic AVRT, where you have a very slowly conducting retrograde accessory pathway. So we need some way of differentiating um, the focal atrial tachycardia from the other two, the forms of uh, AVRT and AVNRT that I've mentioned. And that's difficult to do from the ECG alone, and we have to use manoeuvres in the cath lab. So have a look at this ECG, and I'd like your thoughts on the underlying diagnosis. So here's the different options that I have for you. Did you have a good enough look at the ECG or would you like me to go back? There's the ECG one more time. So I suppose we're ready for some voting. I've got to beat Jesus, whatever happens. 25, 26. <laughs> okay, we're there. What do people think? What are the answers? Okay, so some of you have chosen focal electro Of course, all these answers are possible, as most of you have realised from the, any of the above at the bottom, because it's quite difficult to tell um, from this ECG uh, exactly the mechanism. It's very difficult because the P wave is merging into the previous T wave, so this probably is an inverted P wave. could be focal atrial tachycardia coming from the mouth of the coronary sinus, so it's going from inferior to superior. The activation could be an AVNRT, an atypical AVNRT, could be a slowly conducting accessory pathway of which persistent junctional uh, reciprocating tachycardia is. So any of those could be for this ECG. So we need some manoeuvres in the EP lab for dif differentiating between one-to-one -one atrial tachycardia and other forms of SVTs. And there are various things we can look at. The P wave morphology is one that we don't need the uh, EP lab for. If the P waves are positive in 2, 3 and AVF, they're coming from the top of the atrium down towards the annulus. Therefore, it's unlikely to be another form of SVT. That's m almost certainly going to be um, uh, an atrial tachycardia. We should observe the termination of the tachycardia because if it ends with the atrium without conducting to the ventricle, then it's extremely unlikely to be, a, be an atrial tachycardia because you're then hypothesizing not only is the tachycardia terminated, but at exactly the same time there was AV nodal block. So that pushes you towards an SVT. If you measure the VA interval during tachycardia, if you have widely, wildly varying VA intervals, again, that's unlikely in an, in an AVNRT or an AVRT. It tells you it's going to be an atrial tachycardia. And of course, if you can dissociate the ventricle completely, it's an atrial tachycardia. And finally, measure the AH interval during the tachycardia and at the same pacing cycle length. And I've got an example of that. So here we have an atrial tachycardia with one-to-one uh, AV conduction 
and during this we have paced from the ventricle so we have entrained this tachycardia from the ventricle okay and you can see we're pacing one atrium for every ventricle when we stop pacing the tachycardia continues and the ventricle conducts to the atrium the next activation is an atrium and then we go on to have the atrial tachycardia this is VAA conduction that indicates this is likely to be an atrial tachycardia we have entrained the tachycardia because it's a re-entrant circuit by pacing from the ventricle we've accelerated the atrial tachycardia to the pacing cycle length it's returned to its normal cycle length but it's gone AAV, which implies that it must be an atrial tachycardia. So that's a useful manoeuvre if you're uncertain. Not to be confused with this, which is exactly the same manoeuvre. Okay? We have entrained the tachycardia. So here's the tachycardia. This is the tachycardia cycle length. Here's pacing from the ventricle. We've accelerated the atrial tachycardia. And after the pacing spike, we get a VAAV. Is that true? No, it's not. Sometimes this is called the pseudo a V A A V, but in fact, this pacing spike is activating that atrial activation, and this pacing spike has entrained that atrial activation, and the next activation is a V. This is actually a V A V response, which would be consistent with something like A V N R T or an A V R T, rather than an atrial tachycardia. We've entrained the tachycardia; it is a re-entrant circuit, but in this case, it's not focal atrial tachycardia; it's not atrial tachycardia. Um, and then a very useful manoeuvre is if it's an atrial tachycardia conducting through the AV node if you pace the atrium at the same cycle length then you would expect the AH interval in tachycardia and during pacing to be about the same that would imply that this is an atrial tachycardia and here we are Okay, pacing from the heart rate atrium at the same cycle length as the tachycardia and we see the AH interval within 15 milliseconds of each other. Again, that implies that this is an atrial tachycardia. So have a look at this slide. So I'll ask you what you think of this. This patient's in tachycardia. It then terminates back into sinus rhythm. So, uh, and it's at 50 millimeters per second. Okay, so half the sweep speed that we're used to looking at these just to exhibit what's going on. So what do you think the possible uh, or most likely tachycardia diagnosis is here. Okay. Do you think it's some form of AVRT from a postrolateral accessory pathway, either antidromic or orthodromic? Do you think it's typical AVNRT, atypical AVNRT, or a focal atrial tachycardia from the coronary sinus os? Okay, there are your five options. And I'll go back to the electrogram so you can have a think about that for 30 seconds or so. So orthodromic AVRT, antidromic AVRT via a postrolateral accessory pathway, atypical and typical AVNRT, and a focal atrial tachycardia from the coronary sinus os. So what do you think? This is either a harder question or a less interesting question. Okay, should we see what the answers are? So, the most popular answer was focal atrial tachycardia from the coronary sinus os. So my teaching style is failing, I think. Uh, I think the answer here is atypical AVNRT rather than any of the other options. So, we just explore why I think that's the answer. Okay. Um, firstly, looking at the ECG, this is a long RP tachycardia okay it's a long rp tachycardia so it's unlikely to be atypical avnrt it's uh, sorry it's unlikely to be typical avnrt it's unlikely to be an orthodromic avrt if that pathway is conducting normally also i said it was a postrolateral accessory pathway and although i had i should have told you that the, the coronary sinus catheter is at the mouth of the coronary sinus you can see there's proximal to distal in other words concentric activation so it's unlikely that this is coming from any sort of lateral accessory pathway. Of course, it's not antidromic because it's a narrow QRS. If it was antidromic, it would be a broad QRS because all the activation would be going down the pathway. 
and the earliest activation is at the coronary sinus, or the earliest atrial activation is at the coronary sinus os, which is where we find the slow pathway, which is the, in a fast slow or an atypical AVNRT, we'd expect the slow pathway to activate first in the atrium. And the reason that this is not an atrial tachycardia is because it terminates with the A. Okay, it doesn't then get up to the V. A question? Yes, because the last VA interval is shorter than before. So why can't it be an atrial tachycardia that terminates with, a, with an atrial exorcism? Because the VA is shorter than the last VA. Well, um, I suppose that is possible. But it's not. It's it is slightly shorter if it is atrial, an atrial extrasystole. Um, but it's unlikely, I think. And all the other features point to an atypical AVNRT. We can debate that forever <laughs> for the purposes of this teaching session. But you, you've you've spot you have spotted that that cycle length there. If this is an atrial tachycardia that cycle length is not consistent and that's an atrial premature activation okay but the, the diagnosis I do know what the diagnosis is and it was atypical AVNRT and that's the th reasoning behind that so so we've established uh, how to differentiate one to one from AV conduction now we have our focal atrial tachycardia how are we going to map this in the EP lab and Again, the traditional way of doing it was to have, I liked your phrase, strategically placed catheters in the heart um, uh, that allow you to see very quickly where the earliest activation is in the heart. And then you can move around these catheters to cover large areas of the heart and keep looking to find the earliest activation. Because it's the activation from a focus that we're trying to track back to to find where this tachycardia is coming from. I favour performing in atrial tachycardia cases activation map using uh, a 3D electroanatomical system such as the Cartoon map here. And there are lots of good reasons for doing this. You can display very nicely the earliest activation. You also have memory so you can see where you've been with your catheter, where you've ablated. It's a non fluoroscopic. Uh, techniques. So there are various reasons why this is a useful thing to do, particularly for focal atrial tachycardia. One of the limitations of this, of course, is that you need that tachycardia to be stable, to have time to move the catheter around the chamber of interest to perform activation mapping and work your way back to where you think the earliest activation is. So if you're only getting short bursts of non-sustained atrial tachycardia, it's going to be virtually impossible to do this sort of act activation mapping. It'll be easier with catheters because you will see quickly if you're right on the spot, but again, you'd have to be right on the spot of the focus of the tachycardia to be able to target it to a blade. And this is probably the one very useful clinical application of non-contact mapping is that you can map the right atrium very quickly, um, even for a few non-sustained beats. So you can build a shell of the right atrium and then you can map. Now this is sinus rhythm with activation emerging at the top of the crista terminalis and breaking down. And um, the electrograms, the intracardiac electrograms here, which are the non-contact electrograms here, are coming, it's not doesn't project, seven, eight, nine, these numbers down here. This is sinus rhythm. If you go to the next map, you see it's breaking away just anterior to the crista, much lower down. And you'll see you look at the, these are unipolar electrograms, it has that QS morphology or more of a QS morphology suggesting we're very close to the onset of the tachycardia. And you only need to catch a few beats of this to be able to go to that spot, ablate and map. So when you have a non-sustained tachycardia, it's a very challenging thing to map and this is the one of the tools that can help you do that. So let's look at this ECG, okay? Um, this is a patient who came to the cath lab uh, very recently. Um, her, he is in his mid-40s. He's an office worker. And he was having quite a bit of palpitations and breathlessness and was in this tachycardia incessantly. So just looking at some of the statements I've written here, um, 
What do you think about these? What's the most likely to be true? So, just let you have a look at the ECG again. Oh, you can't? Uh, yeah. So is this... Um, have a good look at that. I can't remember what the questions were. So is this atypical atrial flutter? Is this a focal atrial tachycardia from the superior mitral valve annulus? Or is it from the left atrial appendage? <coughs> Do we see the Wenke back phenomena? Is this a long RP tachycardia? Or should you never make, or can you never make a diagnosis from without an EP study? Okay, I have the answers, please. So whenever you see never in a question, that is never the right answer, okay? <laughs> that's a good multiple choice. Or always or never, that's never the right answer, okay? Because, you know, uh, of course you can make a diagnosis without necessarily having an EP study. Um, it's not a long RP tachycardia because it's not one-to-one -one, uh, AV conduction. Um, uh, and it's clearly not a focal atrial tachycardia from those uh, locations because of the morphology of the P wave, which is inverted in the inferior leads. And um, the diagnosis is not uh, atypical atrial flutter, um, well, depending on what you think atypical atrial flutter is, but this is a focal um, atrial tachycardia. But you're correct, there is the wenke back phenomenon visible here, short uh, AV time, longer AV time, back to the shorter one. Okay. Um, and here, short, longer, and there's one in here that's blocked, and back to the shortest again. Okay. That is the wenke back phenomenon. We're seeing that in this tachycardia. So um, we map this tachycardia, and um, you can see it's a long cycle length, persistent throughout the case, very stable, very straightforward uh, procedure. And um, the earliest, I've just sort of lined up with the onset of the P wave, the earliest activation we found was around the coronary sinus, and detailed mapping in the coronary sinus found really not that impressive but clearly fractionated electrogram just inside the mouth of the coronary sinus um, just about 30 milliseconds ahead of the P wave when ablating inside the coronary sinus trying to be very gentle we used 30 watts we used high flow and irrigated cath to allow us to deliver energy and very quickly um, while delivering energy we were able to terminate the tachycardia. We put some consolidation lesions and got rid of this. We had a, a beautiful Carto map that was lost on the crash disk at our system. So a focal electrical tachycardia coming from the mouth of the coronary sinus. It was a very straightforward procedure. So have a look at this ECG. I'm not going to ask you a question on it. And this was kindly given to me by one of my pediatric colleagues. And you'll see slightly strange ECG numbers right-sided ECG and also V7 posterior ECG leads. But V1, V2, V3 and V4 are here. And what do we think of the P-wave morphology um, in this? Positive in 2, 3 and AVF, suggesting coming somewhere high, working down. Negative in AVL, clearly negative in 1, suggesting coming from the left side. And V1 sort of slightly isoelectric inverted P wave so the suggestion is that it was coming from somewhere lateral and high probably in the left atrium and this was actually uh, I think she was 13 or 14 year old uh, girl with incessant atrial tachycardia emerging from the left atrial appendage and a limited uh, Carto map has been used and you can see how they've struggled to get rid of this tachycardia and despite three attempts at ablation this lady still has, this young girl, sorry, still has um, a focal atrial tachycardia emerging from tissue deep, just posterior to the uh, left atrial appendage. And she's going forward to have cardiac surgery to try and deal with that. So it's my third case for you to look at. Okay, another atrial tachycardia, one-to-one -one AV conduction. P waves here. Um, Positive in the inferior leads, difficult to see what's going on in V1, positive V to V6. And this tachycardia was induced with program stimulation, as you can see here, an uh, anterograde conduction curve, 
an extra stimulus has induced the tachycardia. And it's a relatively long HA time. So this is some form of re-entrant circuit as it was induced by program stimulation. And they attempted to pace to look for, to entrain the tachycardia and to look for the response after ventricular pacing. But what you'll see here is there is ventricular pacing at 270 milliseconds, as you can see from the right ventricular catheters, but the atrial electrograms aren't associated from this. They stay at about 300 milliseconds and they continued on. Okay, So this tachycardia has not been entrained from the ventricle, but the ventricle has been dissociated from the atrium. And that's extremely suggestive that this is an atrial tachycardia. Mapping of this atrial tachycardia found the earliest activation to be sort of, sorry, um, this is the His catheter. You can just about see a His spike. The earliest activation was very close to the His catheter, and there was a fairly long fractionated signal that was found there. So this was a, a focal atrial tachycardia emerging from the His region. Any suggestions how you might deal with this? Radio frequency ablation. Keep your fingers crossed. Any suggestions? Leave it alone. Amiodarone. Any thoughts? What is that? Who knows what that is? That is cryoablation. Okay, that's the interference caused on the catheter by cryoablation. Okay, and, it, and it's said to be a safer way of ablating close to the AV node um, because it's said that the initial effects are reversible. Um, I'm sure um, it's still possible, however, to cause complete heart block if you ablate around the AV node, even with cryoablation. But in this case, they did a very nice job. In fact, there was no hiss spike on the mapping catheter there. They mapped with the cryoablation, they cryoablated, and you can see they terminated the tachycardia for this parahisian focal atrial tachycardia. So I've got a couple more cases and, a couple, and one more uh, question to come. This is a patient who um, was an elderly gentleman with an incessant atrial tachycardia. And I think you can see here there are two P waves for every QRS complex. Okay. He had already been brought to the catheter lab because it was thought that he might have typical atrial flutter at one stage. He'd had a flutter ablation, uh, but it was discovered at the time that he, you know this had a left atrial origin. You hadn't been consented for that procedure, so it was decided to ablate his right atrial isthmus and see how he got on. But as you can see, he had persistent atrial flutter. But as soon as we put catheters into the heart, he developed atrial fibrillation, and it was no longer possible to map this incessant tachycardia. So we'd already decided that we might have to do a pulmonary vein isolation or a wide area circumferential ablation for this patient's tachycardia. And these are actually the electrograms after he has had. Once we did the, the bilateral, uh, ipsilateral, wide lines around the pulmonary veins, he organised back into his atrial tachycardia. And these are the electrograms with the coronary sinus catheter at the mouth of the coronary sinus, and this PV catheter in the left atrial appendage. And this is the P wave, onset of the P wave, here. Okay. We performed activation mapping and entrainment mapping. So we were actually, when we found, we were looking at different sites and trying to entrain from those different sites to see whether we thought the site was close to or in the tachycardia circuit. But this is the activation map that we produced. And you can see it appears to have a focal activation emerging from the sort of postero-septal region of the mitral valve annulus okay um, now the t the, but we'd only mapped here about 200 milliseconds of the tachycardia which is not the entire tachycardia cycle length so the other concern was that in fact here it might actually just be breaking through from the right atrium and in fact this was passive activation in in the left ventricle and you can see from this map you can see the ablation lesions around the right and around the left pulmonary veins where the patients had 
the WAC has done. Also, there was lots of scar in this atrium. Even though we hadn't done any ablation, there was lots of scar in this elderly man's heart. So our analysis by ECG uh, was always going to be very challenging. So we mapped the right atrium, but we focused around the area of interest. There's the tricuspid valve. We've carefully put a cloud of lesions over the hiss. And you can see the earliest activation was in a very similar place. And in fact, you can see we've pressed on the ablation pedal and hope that we can quickly sort things out. And in fact, if you put these two maps together, you will see that it appears to be focal activation breaking away from the area where the proximal coronary sinus and the mitral valve annulus or, or, or posterior septal area there meet. And this is an atrial tachycardia from merging from that. And I thought I would just show you the... These are obviously just activation maps, but they do exhibit very nicely, and you can just they're very easy from your map just to press and play and record at a later date. But this is focal activation breaking away from this area here. And... Um, uh, in a patient who hadn't, whose only previous ablation had been a flutter line. But in fact, when we came to, we ablated in the right eight, in, in the coronary sinus, it didn't terminate the tachycardia. And the, these are the actual electrograms from these three spots, okay, over quite a wide area. Okay, and the very earliest activation, you can see a very fractionated signal. This is, I haven't put on it, this is V, okay, this is V here. This is the atrial electrograms. Okay, you can see in this very small area, virtually the entire cycle length of this focal atrial tachycardia is located. Okay, so I, my hypothesis is, is that this is a micro reentrant circuit in this general area. And in fact, we ablated the very earlier signal and it didn't affect the tachycardia at all. But when we ablated at this even more fractionated but later signal, it terminated the tachycardia and we put consolidation lesion. So a focal atrial tachycardia in a man with a heavily scarred um, atrium and also had atrial fibrillation due to micro reentrant in this area between the mitral valve and the proximal coronary sinus. And I think that's a common site of atrial tachycardias in patients who have scarred hearts, patients who have atrial fibrillation. So have a look at this ECG. This is a patient who had an AF ablation previously and has represented with an atrial tachycardia. And I said before, this is a very common problem. You can see there's more P waves and QRS complexes. This is an atrial tachycardia of some sort. And when patients had AF ablation, we tend to think this is going to be a macro reentrant atrial tachycardia. The cycle length is about six, maybe five small squares, 230, 240 milliseconds, okay? We performed an activation map. Our routine procedure would be to go in, check that the pulmonary veins are still isolated, and then perform an activation map of the left atrium. And this is the activation map that we've performed. And you can see that the earliest activation is very similar to the case that I showed you before. <coughs> I've also shown you the uh, timings of this we have from 129 to 34 milliseconds so we've mapped about 160 of the 240 milliseconds so looking at the ECG and the car to activation map what do you think the likely diagnosis is here any more offers okay we'll see the results please okay so some have said a left atrial roof-dependent tachycardia, which is a very common problem after people have had AF ablation. But the activation map, which can be falling, of course, didn't really look like that because it looked like focal activation spreading away, away from the posterior coronary sinus. Um, typical atrial flutter, um, with it breaking through, is a possibility. It's not atypical AVRT because it's not one-to-one -one atrial uh, A to V. Um, focal atrial tachycardia from the roof of the coronary sinus, very similar to the case we had before. It looked very much like that. Uh, or another focal atrial tachycardia breaking through from the coronary sinus. All of those are possible from what we've seen. But in fact, this is what happened when we mapped the rest of the, When we mapped the right atrium, we found the entire cycle length around the tricuspid valve. And this was simply typical atrial flutter breaking through 
into the left atrium, giving that pattern there. So I've just shown you two cases that on face value look fairly similar, both ECGs and the fact that they're an atrial tachycardia with two to one. But in fact, when you actually map them, you find they have completely different mechanisms. One's a macro entry, and one was a, f a micro entry, although focal uh, within a confined area. So you can be easily fooled in patients who have scarred hearts, who've had previous ablations, and you need to use all the tools available to actually get the mechanism and perform the right ablation. In this situation, a right atrial isthmus ablation terminated the tachycardia. So I hope I've convinced you that a focal atrial tachycardia can have both a re-entrant or an automatic mechanism. The ECG can be useful, but only really in normal hearts. I'm sure we're now confident in differentiating one-to-one one 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 ATACs from other forms of SVTs with pacing manoeuvres. I think 3D mapping systems are very useful. And I didn't really mention it, but these arrhythmia are amenable to catheter ablation. It's a very good way of treating these patients. And that's my reference for your information. Thank you very much.